Um, so welcome everybody. Um, this is the continuation of uh, the presentations, uh, but I think one of the threads we will do is give a teaser of what is about to come next week on frugal optics. Uh, that will be led by Benedict uh, in the session today. But before that, I just also want to have a new mentor that's joined the class, Manish. Uh, do you want to just do a two line intro, Manish? This is a tradition in the class. Perfect. Sure. Uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, I am Manish Kumar. I come from India and right now I'm in US at Northwestern University and this is a very interesting class for me. Uh, I mainly specialize in optics and in fact I have, if I get more time I can talk. This is my first encounter with optics as a class 8 kid when I first bought these magnifying glasses. <laughs> I always carry it with me and I made my own telescope just by holding it with me which was matching exactly with what I read in the book and that has been kind of inspirational thing to see how science works. I mean that's such a beautiful example also because people might not know Manish now builds some of the world's most complex light sheet microscopes. So going from two magnifying glasses in the pocket to what you've uh, been able to do now. You know, that is the remarkable journey of a scientist. So we're going to transition since we have a really short time. Uh, the first half prelude would be by Benedict as a teaser for what is about to come as well on frugal optics. So Benedict, if you wanna share your screen. And sure. I think at one o'clock or something like that in half an hour, we will transition into the presentation modes again for the 20 or so teams that couldn't present last time. Uh, okay, Benedict, all yours. Sure. All right, Joel, then uh, thanks a lot for, for having me here. And so I'll just give a very brief introduction into frugal optics. Um, so there will be more to cover next week for sure. And there was already quite a few people asking me for help in terms of uh, microscopy and devices and so um, today I think I just start with a uh, well general perspective what optics can do and where you face them uh, without actually noticing them so and um, yeah this works so uh, yeah this whole thing photonics so I'm currently working at the Leibniz Institute for Photonics Technology and so this photonic thing, it's basically uh, the science of light. And light is all around us, of course. So you have uh, candles and nowadays, uh, not only that, also lasers. And the idea of um, creating light electrically uh, is already quite old, but there have been also some, some, some animals like butterflies, uh, which have some very interesting um, uh, yeah, properties called uh, nano, photonic crystals and they really have a very nice um, yeah, light in terms of reflection. And um, what is also around, maybe not really seen as optics is glasses. And I think that's one of the most important um, yeah, the, um, uh, inventions during the last, I don't know, uh, 1000 years or so, because uh, since then people can actually see what's around um, them. And um, so that's, I think, one of the very first images of a, of a person who uh, yeah, w wears glasses in 1400s. Um, also very important, of course, in our everyday life is uh, an optical mouse. It's, it's very interesting how this works. So I'll cover that in a, a more detailed section next week. And um, yeah, the, the reason why um, I can see at home um, during night is obviously all the electricity which powers all our light sources. And also one very important aspect, which um, is coming in very handy right now, especially since in Europe, the, the time of Corona cases is rising, is um, diagnostics. So everything uh, where you basically want to uh, get an insight, uh, well, result whether um, you have or have not COVID, for example, or coronavirus, um, is usually done optically, whether uh, by absorption measurements or, um, well, usually final step in uh, PCR is also um, optically done, and I'm um, also a, the reason. A comment, a comment I wanted to make, Benedict here is uh, this is the teaser for what is to come on Tuesday, and yeah. what we'll do is there will be valuable to create a list of materials, Benedict, that you want people to have on their table when they are coming on Tuesday, especially yeah. if they can find a list of a broken mouse 
Ah, I see. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I think because that's, it would be valuable for while you're sharing those sets of things for just common materials people find. So I'll put that together as a course, yeah. for people to search. Yeah. That's actually a very good thing. Yeah. So an optical mouse would be uh, very interesting. So if you find some scrappy parts uh, somewhere, grab it, uh, tear it apart, and look what's in there. Um, um, I'm also going briefly to the next step. So um, the reason why you can see me right now, of course, it's the internet and the reason why it's transmitted uh, through like very large um, distances between, for example, Europe, we are somewhere here, and USA or India or China, wherever, is basically also optically done by total internal reflection. So uh, if you have any fiber-based uh, device, uh, optical fiber-based device around you, um, maybe you can find that and uh, look how this works. So it's um, incredible how much data is getting transported every day. It's all done optically nowadays. Uh, right, and also, um, well, take your cell phone and look what's in there. So um, mine is fairly old already. So it has only two cameras on the back side and one in front. Um, nowadays, <laughs> I've seen people having like eight cameras or something, I don't know. Um, well, definitely have a look what's the specs of the different cameras and also the, uh, the sensors, pixel size, and um, also the, the lens in front of it. So we also have an, another one. Um, it's more recent. It has three cameras. So it's, I think one of those you see there. And it has um, one which has a zoom lens. It has a monochromatic camera and an ordinary camera. So maybe get familiar with, um, with uh, the properties of your camera, which is very interesting. Some of them even have like a, a periscope. So there is buried inside the case. Um, yeah, I don't know how they actually produce that. Um, now, uh, very recent um, iPhone users, they probably have this face scanner. Um, if you have a, uh, well, if you take a second phone and try to, to look at, the, um, at this region here with your camera, you will see some, um, well, varying spot. So it's kind of the same what you could eventually see if uh, I point my camera towards the, the webcam here, there's a, a shine, which is a small scanner, uh, which very fast um, um, scans your face in order to see whether it's you or eventually some other, uh, other person who would like to unlock the phone. Um, also, there's some very cool thing. It's called brightness enhancement feel, um, film, uh, which guides the light and well, so-called old style uh, LCD displays. So if you find a broken cell phone, which is not working anymore, so don't break your cell phone, I uh, also tear it apart and look what's in there. There's um, a whole bunch of different optical components which are really valuable for any kinds of um, uh, science. For, for example, if you want to do whole slide scanning or so, you can use um, the backlight from your uh, cell phone for a very nice homogeneous light source. And also um, different um, cell phone lenses actually. Um, so I, I prepared some very little thing. So I, I took out one of these lenses here, you find here. And if you take your, your cell phone and um, this other cell phone lens, just put it in front of it. Um, and you, uh, well, then it looks like this here. And then I uh, take, for example, another cell phone, which has pixels. And then you can basically visualize the pixels. So I tried to do that uh, in front of the, the camera here. And so I know I think it's not focusing that well, but you can really do microscopic images with your uh, cell phone on the, on the very low cost um, region. So if you want to uh, build a microscope for a euro, that's fairly possible. Uh, just get a broken cell phone. I'll tell you the recipe next week. And One right. comment that I want to make if you go back. Uh, what's very important about this framework is you have to remember because cell phones are made at large scale, when you build a tool or a technology using these OEM parts, they're already available at very large scale for low cost. So it's extremely valuable when you are searching for ideas and implementing to find parts that are used in a completely different application currently. Like for example, this periscope is a beautiful example of something like this. And I think, yeah, just the manufacturing of cell phones in the past has opened up an entire industry of low cost optics. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it would actually yeah. be fun for everybody to find uh, a old cell phone. Uh, because, exactly. yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So it's, yeah, also not only optics, also the, the batteries, um, they are usually very valuable for using at, at night. I think there are some projects around where they use it for um, powering uh, Indian uh, shops at night. So even though it, the telephone is already old, the battery is still working. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> that's very nice project, I guess. Um, so I just skipped a few next slides. Um, so um, yeah, so there's also some other optics involved, more like heavy machine. Uh, I used to work in this kind of um, parts. It's um, but it's it's very bound to to uh, um, yeah to to large quantities in terms of money. Uh, another part where you have, uh, maybe have seen optics is um, this LIGO, where they observe the um, the gravitational waves and the phenomena what they use there it's called uh, interferometry um i will definitely tell you a little bit more next week so it's a very nice um, property of light as a wave and um, with this you can really see very very tiny changes of uh, light or um, basically well dif um, deformation of um, mass and i'll tell you more about that uh, next week and so after this whole thing, I basically, uh, well, moved to a totally different field, uh, what um, Manu is also uh, very famous for is um, microscopy. And for me, microscopy is a very nice tool. It basically creates a bridge between, well, like the, the good part, <laughs> the, um, let's say science, medicine, and research and all that stuff, which is allowed to be open. And the part uh, which I don't like too much because it's very close, it's like industry and economy. and um, uh, we as scientists can build tools to support humanity. That's uh, well, usually what I would like to phrase in best case. But um, well, usually these uh, setups called microscopes, uh, even though it does not really look like a microscope, uh, it's like a black box. So there's definitely a gap um, between the users and those who build it. And it's usually very expensive and it's not really reproducible. So um, what we try to do, and I think there are also many different other people, um, they try to use uh, novel methods. So first I see 3D printing, um, and then also stuff which is, our, uh, which is around already. So let's say a smartphone or some, uh, well, um, rapid prototyping devices like Raspberry Pi or Arduino. You probably uh, know lots of uh, things even more than I do. And very important nowadays is this whole field about image processing. So uh, let it be uh, a very, well, say, simple deconvolution or uh, as you know that from Instagram or so, where you can apply some nice filters to let, let your uh, images look a little bit nicer. This, everything, well, everything is a very frugal approach to create very nice uh, solutions. And you, maybe a few of you already know this very nice piece of technology. It's uh, coming probably without any 3D printing, but lots of cardboard. Um, it's a very uh, low cost microscope. There have, have been some other parts more sophisticated. It's called the MyCube from Johannes uh, Holbein and the open flexure microscope, which was already part of the lecture of the flexure bearings. And this is from Richard Bowman. And um, yeah, so um, still maybe for some of you, this is a black box. And I think we definitely need to get some more insight uh, how these actually work. And for this, I will provide some more tools for next week um, to basically uh, do what microscopy is like the most. It's like zooming in and out into different um, regions of your sample. And maybe to give you um, some more ideas um, to, to get a look um, uh, where you find resources. So what we do here at the Leibniz Institute is um, basically building frugal optics and it's called, so this whole project is called UC2. And I'll just dive into the, this thing and I hope that Zoom lets me share my screen even though it's not PowerPoint anymore. I hope so you see my uh, yeah. browser. So if you go to this webpage, UC2 or U with the UC2, you will find some very rudimentary information about the whole project. The most important thing is basically this JIT because everything we do is always open source. And um, so you go through the website, eventually go familiar with the whole thing. I don't want to um, teeter too much, but it's, everything here is about cubes. So it's um, 3D printed or uh, well produced with different um, strategies. And what you can do is, um, because many people are, do, are doing very crazy projects with optics, uh, 
like um, ecologically uh, uh, monitoring or uh, blood testing, I, I heard already. And I think there is already um, a huge collection of different uh, setups, we call that applications, which eventually could um, fulfill your goal already. So there is a bunch of different um, applications, like an app, uh, which you can just uh, download, print, and uh, assemble. And um, for those who are keen to have a look before I dive into this a little bit more, I um, definitely encourage you to go through um, some of the steps here. For example, I just pick um, the incubator microscope, which we used for um, uh, observing cells in the incubator. For example, here is some dog cells. I'm always forgetting what's the um, should name, some time-lapse images. So what's the most valuable about this whole thing is that everything is documented. So if you, for example, want to replicate it, say, okay, this whole instrument here, it has a light source, it has some optics here and a camera, for example, and it's listed, okay, I have a camera, I have some optics, mirror, and okay, let's say Raspberry Cam sounds like a Raspberry Pi camera module. And okay, this is the camera module, and there's also a step-by-step -step guide on how to assemble that. So if um, you or your project needs some kind of um, assistance with optical uh, assemblies, um, there's a, uh, yeah, a list of tools and also resources, how it works, how to purchase it, because this is also not um, so easy. So you know, Benedict, could, could yeah. you do one thing? If you unshare your screen and what you showed, I think it would be valuable for you to just briefly show the fundamental of how these two things come together and optically align because you showed it physically very quickly and your screen is very small. So if you just mm -hmm. unshare in the part that you have in hand. Mm -hmm. So if somebody Sorry. wants to make one screen big, you can just go and click on make it pin and pin video will make Benedict now full screen. Yeah, I think it would be just valuable. You could just show the heart of this uh, entire object. Right, <laughs> so I must admit, I'm not super well prepared now, but <laughs> no, so just, the, the core. The physical, I think the physical core is very valuable to show because then people will be able to better appreciate that the number of things you can build with this is infinite, which <laughs> is what you just showed. But I think the, the analogy would be fun just showing physically. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, so the core idea, as you already may have grasped, is that um, you can represent optics with cubes <laughs> very easily. And um, so, well, we, or you can uh, synthesize an optical instrument with uh, different units, and we just create a unit with a block. And these blocks, well, they can just arrange, and usually people do that in an optical lab with some very expensive components. <laughs> and um, what we thought, well, let's play Lego, as you probably have uh, heard about this very fancy paradox on about the um, accuracy of putting Lego bricks together. And we thought, well, we should definitely jump on this boat. So uh, it's like you have a base plate. And nowadays, it's a very new feature. Uh, you can also put the base, the base plates together as uh, little puzzle pieces. And then once you uh, have enough of these puzzle pieces together, uh, then you can create optical instruments. For example, this one here is the negative lens. You can see that. And with this, you can then easily build uh, a telescope where you can look through and then eventually observe something. So this looks very frugal and it's also very frugal because it's cheap and also maybe not good in terms of quality, <clears throat> but this is only the framework and then you can adapt that and put it together the way you would like to do that. For example, with a uh, binocular or, or something like that. And if you then, uh, that was uh, maybe one challenge or one take-home message um, besides getting a broken phone. For example, grabbing one of those here. Uh, it's an old CD drive I found in the, in the garbage. And if you open that, there's a whole bunch of different stuff in there, uh, like some PCBs. And the most important part is this whole uh, optical unit here. Um, I turned apart one thing here. It's already one here. Um, and if you take this out, so this is like the small uh, optical pickup unit. This reads the information on your disk. You can easily create a microscope. Um, and here I have a random sample. It's a uh, well, sample from a potato starch. Um, as I said, um, there's one element here uh, right in front of my camera. This is one of these lenses. 
And if I just hold it right in front of it here, you already see that I can magnify it. And so you can magnify it up to a resolution of between one and two micron, depending on your camera. But this is um, like a one dollar uh, solution. And if you know all these different components, which are really, really low cost because they are mass produced and you just put them into our framework, you can create arbitrary um, complicated systems. And that's something I really like. It's between playing and some more sophisticated research. So and I think the more people who participate, the, the better the project will be. So please have a look, <laughs> some small advertisement. <laughs> Yeah, and I think Benedict, maybe we we still have eight more minutes before we dive into presentations. One mm -hmm. thing we could do is on Tuesday, the plan is to really cover a hands-on session. Mm -hmm. And since many of the materials are 3D printed, if people want to prior to Tuesday, some of you have access to 3D printers, you can print certain sets of parts. Uh, and on Discord, you could list which are the first core sets of parts people should print. It would actually be valuable for Tuesday's lecture for all of us to be doing some experiments together. And mm. for some of the common materials that we'll be running demos on, that everybody has access to those and your, because you know, visually seeing something on a screen is one, but to actually experiment it in your own hands is another. So we will try this as an experiment for mm -hmm. Tuesday's class. There's gonna be a little bit of preparation involved and then the list of parts that we will put together even if you can find 10 percent of them and 20 percent of them that's okay you don't have to have all the parts but on tuesday's session what would be really valuable is to we will walk through each one of them where you also get to do the same thing on your end so let's try to put together that list benedict and then if there are certain 3d printed parts you felt for the cubes that would be a core to demonstrate a principle. Um, mm -hmm. You can just highlight, oh, let's let's build this together. Yeah, certainly. So I was thinking, so maybe I just uh, share the screen again. Yeah. So yeah. Um, I just wanted to make sure that you share how these things snap together because that's a fun part and <laughs> not course, so intuitive. Yeah. <laughs> of course, yeah, um, yeah, it is. It's like playing Lego bricks. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so there is, as I said, a very long list of different um, experiments. So for example, there's uh, one for an, uh, a spectrometer. Um, and I think that's one of the, uh, the parts which can be reproduced, well, without uh, lots of effort, because um, I think CDs, um, everybody has. And so um, what's, what's important is basically, uh, in case you would like to replicate this experiment is, uh, grab a CD um, and try to somehow make uh, something which looks like an optical slit. So this is maybe, um, well, sounds weird, but um, well, you, you can find light coming, for example, from your uh, lights, uh, from your torch, from your cell phone. And then the whole um, uh, light is getting diffracted uh, on the uh, CD surface. Um, basically, it's well divided in its spectral um, wavelength, and then you can observe that with your eye. And so there's a list um, of parts you, you need, and I think it would be valuable for you to go through uh, the different um, parts you need for this thing, so to how to assemble this thing. Alternatively, you can go uh, to the projector. I think that's even easier, and it's also much better documented. Um, which uh, guides you through the whole concept of how can we create an image. So again, you have a, a light source involved illuminating some sample, for example, a, a microscopic slide, and then a secondary lens, or like only one lens, but basically the lens just makes sure that you create an image somewhere. So and um, even though it's just an image, you can, uh, well, see how optics works. And I think for this whole experiment, you basically really just need one cube and one lens. And the cool thing about this, um, uh, this whole concept is that we, well, everything's open source and uh, we also have a, a tutorial on how to design a lens holder. So the concept is uh, of, well, the cube here itself, it's uh, that modular that it's always the same, but everything what you put in there is basically defining the function. So once you 
have a lens and you want to put it in there, you go to this tutorial and create your own uh, lens holder. And then you can uh, print it, for example, different lenses here. And then uh, you can, uh, yeah, create cool experiments. <laughs> So I yeah, think and I think the idea would be is Benedict amongst the ones that are documented. I think the the spectrophotometer would be a really fun one. We could also either, mm -hmm. but let's choose one. And then I know a few of you at least have access to printers. And so for Tuesday, it'll actually be really fun for some of you who are able to recreate. And again, this is the power of frugal science that sharing is simple and easy. And mm -hmm. the sets of challenges that you face while building it will also help Benedict to understand, ah, I know this is how I need to solve these problems because somebody had a printer that didn't have that resolution or they exactly. had an optical piece but didn't know how to mount it. So let's keep that in mind for Tuesday. And then Benedict on Discord, let's choose one instrument mm -hmm. that folks that have printers will try to print. That sounds awesome. And so also one, uh, one more comment. So if you find any, anything here, not really, uh, uh, intuitive, please uh, file an issue so that we can improve this system. So the idea is that, um, it's getting that, re that much of, of reproducibility that people every, everywhere can do the same experiments. And, um, once you have a printer, which is not really working with our stuff, then you should improve the system so that it's getting more reproducible, of course. So if you find an error, please, please um, file it so that the person after you uh, can eventually use something which is even better. That's the whole thing about the open source, so that it's the whole thing about participation. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so we are out of time. I want to transition to, this was a teaser. Uh, I wanted to make sure that we are prepared for the session for Tuesday. Uh, but I also want to make sure now that we finish the presentations that were remaining. So first of all, thank you, Benedict. Uh, and this is only the starting point for the next case study, which will be all about frugal optics, both applications uh, and then a session on being able to build and maybe also a little bit of theory, just so you all know the background mathematics that goes behind in designing these instruments, which is extremely important. Uh, but I think Sometimes the theory keeps many people away from designing optical instruments. So you can start with play and you will be so excited by it that you would be passionate about learning the theory. So you can do it either way. It is, you know, it's perfectly okay to first build something and then have the desire to understand it. Uh, so on that note, Tyler, do we have a list? Can you share the list of the remaining uh, talks? And I hope the rest of the folks are ready. Uh, I have to say the last session was just one of the most inspirational parts of this year has been pretty tough on all of us. And I watched back the video again, and I'm just so excited with all the projects that you're proposing, but also just the, the level of creativity and curiosity and collaboration that you're bringing to the table. Uh, so with that note and high expectations, we will transition to the next round of teams. Tyler, you're gonna share your screen. If you just copy that list. Yes, so the first uh, the first few we're gonna do um, were people that we missed last time. Um, S, do, does anyone know who SRP is on Discord? I think that was the current, uh, that was the, the name of the um, like ID that was posted uh, for this group. And I think we couldn't find them last time. So yeah, let's um, start Tyler so guess, and what we will do is just the ones that we didn't find, we will post on chat and unless somebody claims it uh, in that time, but I want to make sure that let's Yeah, start let's start with, with Song. That are present. I think yeah. Song uh, missed last time. And can you share the list? Uh, uh, yes. On Slack so I can unmute people as needed. Sure, yeah, so we're gonna start with Sung and then I'll send the full rest of the list. Okay. All right, Sung, the floor is yours. Uh, oh, I guess you're still copying that. <laughs> sorry, okay, mm -hmm. and yeah. here we are.
Sung, can you hear us? Oh, do I need to unmute? Oh, you do. Sorry about that. Okay, I have unmuted Sung now. Hello? Yes. Yes, we hear you. Go for it. Oh, <laughs> great. All right, all right, let's do this. Um, okay, uh, good afternoon. So originally we began with the idea of simply tracking microbial evolution in the wild, which turned out to be incredibly broad. So we quickly settled on to tracking microbial evolution in aquatic ecosystems in particular. Now, just a little bit of background. 70% uh, of the planetary Earth's surface consists of water. 97% of that is saline, ocean water, 3% of that is fresh water. Now, just to put that number into perspective, since uh, we have a tendency to imagine um, aquatic ecosystems as being more or less empty and just filled with water, uh, phages, viruses of bacteria from the oceans lined up on top of each other in a single line will be 200 million light years long. Phages just from the fresh water lined up on top of each other will be about 6 million light years long. Now, as a comparison, the diameter of the Milky Way is about 200,000 light years long. So we're really talking about a ridiculously large molecular system that spans across 1,000 galaxies right next to essentially where we live. Now, why is that relevant? Well, about 50% of the global population will live within three kilometers of a freshwater body. And that number is increasing rapidly. Even with COVID, um, the concentration of both the population and the increase of the population itself is to such an extent that the, um, uh, the urban population, global urban population surpassed the global rural population for the first time in 2009 and is increasing at, at basically almost uh, compounding a percentage. Now, tracking change. Um, this means that within the next few decades, we'll be looking at the first global scale clash between the rapid population increase across a very specific set of aquatic ecosystems that covers the 3% of the surface water ecosystem. If we do not tr start tracking microevolution now, we might not get another chance. Next slide, please. Now, even with that said, this proved to be an increasingly, incredibly uh, complex and broad question. So we started asking more questions to narrow down the question itself. So what are we going to look at and for how long? Well, how long turned out to be a relatively simple answer. There's a, there's a paper from Richard Lensky lab where they um, observed continuous evolution of bacteria from 1980s onwards. It's even ongoing right now. And according to their data, about 30,000 generations of E. coli in laboratory environments under constant pressure is capable of producing a drastic metabolic change. In their case, citrate uh, metabolizing E. coli. That translates to about 10 human years. So to begin with, we're going to design an experiment that centers around 10 human years time. Now, what are we going to look at? Well, screening every single thing in freshwater ecosystem is impossible. Uh, we're going to narrow down the most dominant phyla that are already present in waters that have been surveyed, and that's actinobacteria, proteobacteria, bacteroidetes, and vericomicrobia. Now, we're working to narrow down these entire phyla into very, very specific samples of uh, species and genus that might be present in a um, more global population of freshwater communities. Now, with the time and the object um, uh, specified, we also found more uh, limitations that we can address in our question. Um, time's up. Do you want to say oh. one word about the team? All right. Let's see. Uh, right now, our team is three members, Pradeep Devsham and myself, and we are looking for historians, education specialists, water and sediment uh, sampling specialists, and uh, someone with um, expertise in evolutionary biology who can pick out such things as ortholog genes that we might be able to look for in particular phyla that we are aiming at. Awesome. Okay. We're Thank you. Thank you.
to next is Betsy. I'm gonna unmute you. Hello. Hello, go for it, Betsy. Oops. Okay, great. So hi everyone, I'm Betsy Lewis and our team is passionate about developing a solution to locust swarm destruction. And you, this is a picture to show how terrible it is. The weather and climate conditions are supporting this irregular phenomenon of a desert locust population explosion. So the implications of these swarms is evident following their characterization, as you can see from these large numbers. Um, swarm sizes can stretch to 2,400 square kilometers. And for context, the density has forced an aircraft off course in Ethiopia. Um, so now imagine 150 million locusts in each square kilometer of this swarm traveling as fast as 100 miles in one day. So these swarms leave crops and rangeland completely destroyed, radically changing the resource and economic stability of the impacted communities in an instant. Um, you can continue, please, Tyler. Thank you. Um, so we haven't made any formal decisions about what direction we'd like to approach with our solution, but um, we've been considering solutions at different stages of their development cycle, which you can see on the screen. And the major solutions right now are to spray aerosol pesticides, or um, we've been talking a lot about how they respond to sound as a temporary approach to this situation. So we're really interested in using the current tracking data to direct our approach better. And yeah, we have a really great team so far, but we're really interested in someone who has better software machine learning expertise. Sounds great. Okay, time's up. I don't know how suddenly you got muted uh, or... Uh, and I think, yeah, one of the threads that I'll do is uh, post the presentations. Uh, we will also, based on the sets of needs that people describe, we will pull in more mentors as well. Uh, Tyler, the list that I have is uh, merged, so I can't, uh, can you send that one more time? I see the next person oh. is Gargi. So yes, that's right. I know. Yeah. Uh, uh, if you just look at the capital letters, I think there's no easy way for me to space it out. Got it. I see two Gargis. I will unmute both of them. Gargi, can you hear us? Uh, seems like I cannot unmute Gargi for some reason. I click on ask to unmute and nothing happens. Okay. Hello? Perfect. Yeah. Hello everyone, my name is Gargi. We are team Infant Health Monitoring and we are pitching for this idea. Uh, this idea was put forth by Anesta and we really liked and got interested into this idea. So uh, when we think of infant health, we think of various diseases that occur in the infant and enteric bacterial and viral infections, they continue to be the leading cause of deaths in children under the age of five. Uh, the, uh, uh, basically, these pathogens are the ones causing the gastrointestinal tract infections or the GI tract infections. Common among them are uh, diarrheal diseases or the intestinal flu. Uh, also, according to this report by IHME, uh, diarrheal diseases, they are the third leading cause of deaths in children under the age of five. Uh, the year 2017, uh, it reported more than 55 lakhs deaths uh, of children under the age of five because of diarrheal diseases. So uh, also the number of deaths attributed to such diseases, they are high in countries with limited access to resources and low income countries. So uh, these clearly reflect the high, uh, uh, the high mortality rates. They just clearly reflect the poor diagnosis and poor health intervention in children. And also the main reasons why children are dying from diarrhea is because of poor diagnosis, which often lead to poor and lack of access to essential treatment and the uh, diarrhea associated risk factors such as unsafe drinking water and poor sanitation. 
Uh, so the question is, how can we monitor uh, health of a child using easily available and accessible samples? So uh, fecal samples, they are the valuable source of information of uh, gut microbiota. So uh, we want to look into how can we monitor infant health through fecal samples in low income countries and where there is limited access to resources. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, nowadays, uh, PCR is becoming the gold standard for uh, as a diagnostic test, but still uh, stool culture tests, they are routinely used. But again, there are limitations to these tests because it takes more than two to three days to uh, get the results. Also, they are expensive. It requires skilled manpower and a proper laboratory setup and associated resources. So, uh, but again, we need to diagnose these diseases because uh, every child has a right to live a, a disease-free and a healthy life. So can we have diseases which can be rapid, which, can, which are affordable, cost-effective, and which can be used by any lay person uh, without the need for a proper laboratory setup? So uh, currently, uh, we are a team of five members. And we are looking for anyone who's interested in this problem, anyone who's enthusiastic. Um, perfect. Um, and I think uh, this is very relevant because uh, there is a platform that Anesta worked on uh, for some time that's very relevant to this. So we'll kind of follow up on that. Um, I don't know, Tyler, the second person who's... Uh, Next is Subir. Subir, okay. Subir, you're unmuted. Yeah. Hello. Can you hear me? Hello. Yes, go for it. Yeah. Hi, I speak uh, on behalf of the Bioacoustics team. We are inspired by the problem Kishore brought to light. Kishore is a researcher and a volunteer working with human wildlife interactions in southern India. Elephants travel a lot in search of food. Earlier, when forests used to be big, this was not such a big problem. However, reduction in their habitat has forced these animals to venture to otherwise dangerous human settlements and farms for food. As a consequence, farmers suffer heavily when, they, when these elephants raid their crops. So they react with building ditches, electric fences if they have the money, firecrackers, or all day long patrolling across the far forest borders. This is very taxing to the small farmers and thus we need a better solution. So the core problem we choose to work on is, can we sense elephants from very far? We found that this could be, oh, uh, can you change the slide? Yeah, thanks. We found that this could be possible by listening to the bioacoustics of elephants. Elephants make these uh, vibrations while walking or talking between each other. These vibrations in the form of infrasound and seismic waves can be sensed from very far distances, sometimes kilometers. If the villagers could only listen to these vibrations and determine the move, 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 motives of the elephants, then these could then they could take appropriate actions in advance. Now, how do we do these? Uh, how do we detect these vibrations? So there are commercial geophones and infrasound mics, uh, which are costly and complicated. Uh, DIY infrasound detectors are uh, uh, the plans are available on the internet, but again, some has, someone has to build the electronics for it. So that's still not frugal. What we are wondering is, can could we use the ordinary computer mouse as a bioacoustic sensor? Uh, this is just an idea. We don't know whether it will work or not, but uh, we have learned that elephants are shit scared of mice. So we are very hopeful <laughs> that, that it will work somehow. Uh, Next slide, please. We are a small, uh, passionate team of three people here with Kishore as our mentor and field guide. Sumitra is a teacher of physics and mathematics and has actually worked with song, birds, and uh, sounds and vocalizations. Nishk is an architect and he's also interested in building safety and if we could listen to the safety uh, acoustics of the building to determine if it's safe or not. I am a freelance maker and we are, we are actually, uh, we'll love to have more team members and mentors who could guide us on bioacoustics or sound or even electronics. Thank you. Awesome, thank you. Uh, one of the threads there is, uh, it's important to think about elephants themselves use these vibrations for long distance communication. So we know that in their feet, there is a signal already. Uh, I'm assuming next is Navakant. Okay, Navakant, you're muted. 
Yeah. Brenda also. Say that again. Brenda, Brenda. Brenda, I have unmuted her as well. Great, thank you. So we are Team Soil Lab, and the problem that uh, the question that we were looking forward to answer was: Can we create a frugal soil quality test kit for farmers even at remote location? So this came to my mind when I was thinking about. Farmers, every 30 minutes, at least one farmer dies in India because of suicide. There are various reasons, but even environment is one of them. And most of them are unaware why they have a crop failure. And one of the reasons is inad inadequate or deficient soil management. That sometimes can lead to complete soil uh, crop failure. And while doing my literature survey, I was even surprised to know that even US and UK has one of the highest suicide rates of farmers. So it was really sad to see that. And soil quality testing is one of the necessary uh, thing that is required to adjust other parameters that will be used for cultivating a crop. And we were looking forward to uh, testing the organic matter, nitrogen, potassium, uh, phosphorus, pH, electrical conductivity. And to make it frugal and make it under $2. Most of the places it is very expensive and some places it is inaccessible to many people. So next slide. Yeah, so we're thinking about different types of solutions. Um, so we thought a little bit about doing something um, similar to like paper-based microfluidics, but we've also thought about maybe calorimetric. Um, then I read a paper about some smart smartphone apps that can be used to um, detect like, the change in the color of soil. So, so there are many, many different cost of solutions. We don't have one yet. We don't know how it will look like or what it will be, but we're very sure that we want it to be based on the best existing knowledge and solutions. Uh, we want it to be accessible for everyone. So it has to be cheap and really frugal. Um, then sometimes these results can be really hard to interpret. So um, we want it to be really easy to, to access this information and the, so the farmers can really know what they're, what they're doing to their soils. Um, and then we want it to be reliable as well. Next one, please. Yeah, so right now we have a, uh, about 13 members and almost all have met except me. Uh, and right now we have the skill set that is on the second column. And we have a chemist, agriculture knowledge, plant pathologist. But we are in need of designers, microbiologists, and people who are expert in soil sciences. And even we want a person who can make everything frugal. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, anyone who has this uh, has these knowledge can definitely join. Okay, time's up. And, and even everyone speak. else can contribute as well. Uh, same comment as last time on the diabetes team. I think it's perfectly okay. It's fantastic that you've collected a large group of people around an important idea. And I think what will become valuable is to also divide them into subgroups as well. Because then either you could take multiple approaches or even in the same approach, uh, cascade and block diagram your problem. Um, I think next is Harini. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I'm Harini. Uh, I'm presenting on behalf of the surface contamination team. So the big, uh, can I have my slides? I think Sorry. it's just loading. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so the big problem that we want to tackle is the spread of infectious diseases. Uh, I think in the wake of this pandemic, all of us have also gotten a better excuse to focus not only on COVID-19, but also the spread of other common infectious diseases that are also quite deadly and are everyday problems that we need to handle. So there, uh, so worldwide, there are uh, like 1.7 million deaths from just diarrheal diseases and 1.5 million deaths from respiratory infections. 
uh, that's just annual. So due to all this increased population growth and uh, uh, the world becoming a cramped up space, transmission of diseases uh, is becoming uh, more and more common. So the problem that we narrowed down uh, from this big problem is how can we control uh, the spread of diseases through fomites. So fomites are nothing but a fancy term for surfaces that have pathogenic contamination. There are other ways through which uh, pathogens can spread through like airborne and person-to-person -person contact, but uh, we think that fomites are something that have not been really focused on and something that kind of picked our interest to narrow down to. Uh, so the main problem of fomite transfer usually occurs in hospitals. Can I go? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, not the next slide. The same slide. So the main problem of fomite transfer is usually in hospitals where sterilization and hygiene becomes a very important issue uh, through commonly used objects like stethoscopes, uh, temperature uh, measuring thermometers, and even, uh, even just identity patches. So what we thought uh, would be a good idea is to focus on, uh, can you go to the next slide? To focus uh, on a technique for color changing, uh, uh, a technique for color changing substance that can identify any pathogen on surface. So we had a goal of uh, having a coating of some substance that can be like a litmus test, something that's as frugal and as commonly used. So the path that we wanted to take was uh, two phase. In phase one, we thought we can identify what aspects of bacteria and viruses uh, can help in color detection. So the next thing we, we would like to know is uh, how long do these surface, uh, these uh, pathogens stay on surfaces and what makes them stay on those surfaces for such long. And I think one of the bigger problems would be to identify whether those pathogens are active or dead. So uh, uh, really, uh, the next phase, Time's up. Okay. Do you wanna say one word about your team currently? Just. Yeah, so yeah. So we have uh, expertise in uh, mostly biology and uh, neuroscience and uh, even a little bit on coding. So we would need a mentor who is more uh, uh, associated with hospitals and we would need someone who can do a little bit of modeling to molecular modeling. Yeah, and I think it would be valuable if you're thinking about this to narrow down the question of fomite transmission in a specific place. So a hospital is a great place to start. Yeah. Uh, next is Job uh, or Jamil, and I don't see either of them. So uh, is Job, uh, let me try again. We can skip to the next, maybe if they're not here. Um, yeah, so Job, if you're there, uh, can you join? Yeah, let's move to Adu Rafiq. Rafiq, are you there? Oh yeah, okay. Oh shoot, uh, sorry, this is a keynote, which unfortunately I cannot open. Um, so we're gonna have to skip this one too. I'll, I can do that. Oh, you can, okay, let me unshare that. Yeah. Uh, oh. Do I have to download it? I think you will. Yeah. Yeah, uh, am I audible? Yeah, you can get started while I'm just about to open up your slide deck. Yeah. So uh, I'm presenting on behalf of the uh, team. Uh, so basically what we are looking at it is that uh, uh, visually impaired community, uh, there are a lot of things which are uh, not accessible uh, to uh, visually impaired uh, community. And uh, uh, because of that, uh, it's, it's a form of uh, social uh, uh, exclusion or uh, discrimination. So for example, uh, uh, just imagine how easy, how early the uh, discrimination starts. So we have a quote from a uh, teacher. So we have been interacting with uh, uh, visually impaired community. So one, uh, this is the quote uh, from a teacher who teaches uh, to uh, science to uh, visually impaired uh, students. So uh, she said, uh, we skip microscopic uh, biology uh, topics because it creates confusion in uh, their mind, their imagination. 
so basically we just uh, skip uh, uh, that uh, that particular uh, part uh, from the curriculum and there have been many such uh, cases where uh, there is a visual component to it uh, generally teachers uh, keep it. so because of which that uh, uh, exposure start very early and then there are very uh, few sets of career uh, which visually impaired uh, community can actually uh, uh, you know uh, choose as a career and it not in not in just uh, 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 in third world country but in even uh, first world country you will see that uh, there are only few limited uh, uh, careers which they can uh, choose and in many countries uh, visually impaired community have to be uh, unimpaired because there is no uh, access so uh, just yeah so oh, so uh, we want sorry you want me to switch slide yeah yeah so basically uh, what we are uh, 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 our vision is that the reason uh, uh, for example science is inaccessible is because it has a very strong visual component and then uh, it is for visual com uh, impaired community it is very difficult to imagine something which they don't uh, uh, experience for example microscopic world or a micro microscopic world galaxies and uh, uh, at uh, at that scale so uh, there are various uh, uh, right now there are different representation which are used for example there is a braille there are touch based uh, uh, ipads or uh, uh, braille uh, with uh, logos and other things but they have not solved the problem so it hasn't uh, uh, suddenly changed that the braille community uh, visually impaired community also is now uh, able to uh, do science so basically what we want to uh, uh, do is our vision is that uh, we we want to uh, create a vision neutral uh, representation representation system uh, which can make this uh, 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 for example make science uh, uh, accessible to visually impaired community next slide uh, so this is our uh, team uh, basically we are looking at it uh, uh, the problem as a, uh, a form of discrimination and we are trying to uh, uh, come up with a, uh, a representation which is mostly uh, tactile but uh, we want to make it frugal so that it is accessible to anybody so there are right now there are few solutions but they are really expensive so we have uh, somebody who's uh, working with visually impaired community that is nithi then there are some who have tried uh, braille and they know how to write and uh, read braille then we have uh, so we have subir we have uh, nithi we have uh, uh, nias we have uh, ajmala we have sheetal so they all they all are from different uh, background and uh, uh, some expertise in uh, tackling this kind of problem but we are looking uh, looking for more people who can actually help us also design uh, some uh, frugal solution around this part so we have been yeah i do okay. uh, time is up uh, again a phenomenal example of just such a fantastic team coming together on a question that's so important just like what happened last time um, and i think it's very valuable you said you're actually talking to the teachers because addressing their problems would be very valuable uh, let's keep moving i mean just braille just in general electronic braille is way too expensive so by that itself is a important problem um next we are can you next is Corin, who i unmuting? tried to unmute at least oh you already did that oh bummer. yes this is not our existing slide deck i guess it wasn't um we uploaded but that's fine hi um uh, sorry i could check to find the the newer one um so i'm representing team micro micro paper it's um, I'm hoping it was re uploaded. But if not, that's mm. totally fine. Yeah, I think um, it's the only one I'm seeing. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. Um, so we're focusing on uh, rapid low cost disease diagnostics. And one of the problems that we're really focusing on are the big anchoring problem is that 400 million people have no basic health care, and 1.6 billion people in the world live in very fragile settings where access is limited. And current disease testing. Uh, requires expensive tooling and materials, is hindered by distribution channel fragility everywhere in the world. You can even see that in the United States with COVID testing. Um, and uh, is hindered by the training requirements, conduct and process tasks. 
And so we have been focusing on or looking at um, a bunch of disease areas and uh, haven't focused on one yet, but it came to light that maybe there's a way to create a platform that could address multiple things as well as environmental causes. So a lot of solutions, especially cancers, uh, are actually influenced greatly by pesticides and water and soil toxins. So next slide, please. Um, so possible solution spaces, we're thinking about low cost tool platform, paper tool platform that can serve multiple types of diseases via the use of component parts. So this is a Lego approach to assembly tool design and how might we use origami and kirigami and compliant mechanisms to create multi-layered microfluidic tool testing? And can we use micro-injected based sample collection um, into these devices? And we're also imagining the possibility of maybe even a palette of prepared stable reagents. So think of like a watercolor set or a makeup set where you can add in those reagents and design um, in place the testing tools on site. Um, and then that question about uh, environmental impact, can we create tools that speak to each other? So can we have a component that's wearable that tests for and senses the environmental factors that interfaces with the tool that tests for disease? Um, and then lastly, how might we include frugal biomarkers um, that for result output? Next slide. And this is our team. We have 10 people. Um, it's been really fun to connect with them this week. And uh, we have a lot of expertise in biology, um, looks like microfluidics, molecular biology. Uh, we're hoping to find someone that can mentor us uh, more in terms of material science and additional microfluid information. Um, and additionally, somebody with um, fabrication design experience because we only have one um, person that's I'm a DIY maker. So um, very low <laughs> on the skill set there. Um, yeah. So I'm at time. Out of time. Yeah, that was fantastic. Um, Tyler, you'll have to tell me the next person. I see Kasim. I don't see you online. John Kasim, are you online? Uh, okay, we might have to move to. Oh, Brenda, are you presenting for them? Okay, I will. Brenda, I will unmute you again. Uh, Brenda, can you hear us? Uh, yeah, I can hear you. Thank you. Yeah, I'll be presenting uh, for them today because they couldn't connect. Yes. Um, so our team is called Fishai, and we're going to be focusing on microplastics as a problem. So I'm just going to give you a quick definition about microplastics, and they are defined as any type of plastic fragment that is less than five millimeters in length. So unfortunately, unlike a um, let's say a plastic bottle floating on a river or in the ocean or a big pile of plastic there, we cannot really see microplastics, um, but they, so we cannot really see the extent of the problem, uh, but they are widespread in the environment. So in our oceans and river alone, um, for example, there's an estimated 51 trillion microplastics, which is about 8 million tons. Um, and unfortunately, again, these microplastics um, don't only make the water polluted, um, but they can also have like ecological, human health, and also financial implications. So it's really bad um, and, and we really need to do something about it. Uh, from a human health perspective, um, we, we don't really have a lot of information about what they can do, but ingestion of microplastics can trigger immune responses, release toxic substances that have been linked to cancer, and also act as delivery systems for pollutants um, that are picked up from the environment. So uh, despite all of these problems, uh, microplastic detection and removal is still a challenge. And 99% of the ocean plastic is missing uh, because it goes undetected or it's degraded or consumed by organisms, right? So our team is planning to focus on plastic detection within inland water bodies and particularly rivers. Next slide, please. So we're thinking about, we've been talking about different methods. Um, some go by like trapping these this microplastics, um, also collecting water samples, um, and, and maybe try to analyze them by collision or like an op using an optic system. Um, another option would be just like on the stream without collecting the sample, just measuring on the site, uh, maybe using hyperspectral imaging. Um, so we, we don't really have a solution just yet. Uh, we're thinking about because it's, it's a really big issue right now. 
Um, in terms of the audience, we're going to be looking at everyone pretty much who wants to, to measure or, or see the distribution of these microplastics. So it's scientists, but also policymakers, industries, and community scientists. Next slide. So as for the team goes, we have uh, varied skills. We have some math modeling, um, engineering, citizen science, ecology, biophysics. But we're really looking right now for people that have uh, chemical engineering skills or knowledge about colloidal science to, to be able to, to gather all these people that, that we can work with to tackle this problem. And that's it. Thank you. Awesome. Right. Thank you. Right on time. And I think uh, we have several uh, ocean-specific people, Brenda, that I'll connect to this team. So next is Rahul. Great. Rahul, can you hear us? Mm, I am clicking on ask to unmute and it doesn't do anything. Mm. Rahul, can you write on text if you can uh, unmute yourself? Or... Tyler, can you try that? I click on that button and nothing happens. Uh, yeah, I'll give it a shot. Yeah. Uh, I see the second. Uh, let's go on to the next one for now. Hold on, just there is a second person, Tanvi. I'll try unmuting Tanvi. Actually, I cannot unmute anybody at this point, looks like. Uh, hello. Oh, Tanvi, we can hear you, yes. Okay, so um, I'm representing the oral cancer team. So it is, uh, the problem statement is how do we identify the early markers of oral cancer? So for now, according to the latest data, it is about 300,000 cases worldwide. And most oral cancer cases are related to tobacco use, alcohol use. And lately, the new research shows that it might be due to infection by the human papilloma virus. And belonging to India, I know how it is because I'm a dentist myself. And I have seen that um, people are not aware of the importance of oral hygiene. People do not visit their dentists for regular checkups. I have seen patients who visit at 45 years and they tell me they haven't yet gotten the scaling done even once in their life. So it's so important to identify biomarkers really early, maybe before stage three, so that the cancer can be prevented because the major problem with oral cancer is late detection. The problem has to be dealt more with the rural settings because they lack facilities and that is where more awareness is needed. Next slide, please. So the common biomarkers may be um, salivary biomarkers because they're in direct contact with the oral cancer lesions and thus making them more specific, which can be DNA, RNA, mRNA, cytokines, P53, tissue polypeptide, specific antigen, and many more. Blood can also be used as a biomarker for circulating RNAs. So the possible solutions our team has thought of are digital screen device with an app-based um, question answer that can be forwarded to a dentist, a microfluidic bandage with inbuilt sensors which can detect the RNAs like we have one for skin cancer now, use of nanoparticles for screening and liquid biopsy which is non-invasive because being a dentist I know People say the lesion is painless and they are not aware that they need to get a biopsy done and they don't, don't give in for an invasive biopsy. So maybe saliva can be used for a liquid biopsy. Next slide. So my team member was just fascinated by the idea of new team members that uh, she forgot to give me access and uh, add our expertise. So <laughs> we actually belong to chemistry, biology, zoology, all my team members and I'm a dentist. So we would love to have more people with oncology medical research background, IT people with expertise in application development, sociology and public health, and uh, lastly, anyone with a passion to work on this problem because that is what matters the most. Thank you. Okay, time's up. Uh, perfect. And I think it's amazing to have a dentist associated in this problem because, you know, to understand what it means, uh, 
mm-hmm. having yeah. that experience is just absolutely fabulous. Uh, Tanvi, I'll pleasure. connect offline because this is a space that we have worked for yes, many sir. years. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the next is Gargi again. I think we have two Gargis in the class, so I don't know which one to unmute. I'll unmute both of you. And then, uh, hello. Of, okay, you're uh, already there. Am I audible? Uh, yeah. Yes. Okay. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Good morning. Uh, so I'm Gargi and I'm speaking on behalf of my team, which is uh, Team Replace Plastic. Um, on Tuesday, we already saw two more teams working to solve the same issue, and that really shows how serious the issue is. So, um, yeah, we are as passionate as the other teams. So, on the screen, you can see the uh, some facts actually, uh, which is um, about out of uh, 9.2 billion metric tons of plastic, about 6.3 billion uh, tons uh, does not even make it to recycling. And some even end up in uh, landfills. Uh, takes around 10 to 1,000 years to degrade, depending on its type. One of the major contributor is single-use plastic or those use and throw kind of materials that we use on daily basis. A lot of it gets dumped into the ocean, and we are aware of the microplastic uh, and how it destroys the aquatic life. So that is harming the environment as well as uh, human beings. In developing countries, uh, no, the previous slide, yeah, it's okay. Uh, in developing countries, it is the major source of uh, global ocean plastic pollution. And yeah, since, uh, next slide, Tyler. Yeah, so um, here, here are some solutions. So basically solving the uh, plastic crisis is both uh, art and science. And since it is a multidisciplinary project, we are focusing on a single use type of plastic products. Uh, basically, we will look into the biodegradable materials which can be used in, as an alternative. Also, uh, in the market, there are already many products, uh, but we will focus on the products which uh, is a low cost, durable, and it, the things used in fabrication or manufacturing ends up uh, leaving no residue in the environment. We will try and see if the art of origami can be used to do something innovative with the product. Uh, like we have seen some origami based bottles. Also, uh, we need an online database of waste uh, entry system that can be helpful in tracking the waste management globally. Some are few charitable trusts and system IQ, but these uh, system needs to be on a global scale. Also, we'll try to take uh, take some inspiration from tribal communities and tools they have been using to make such things. Uh, like in northeastern parts of India, they use bamboo to make water bottles or other products. So, yeah, it's the high time we think of our relationship with the plastic. Uh, next slide, Tyler. Okay, so here is our team. Uh, we have people from chemical engineering background, material science background, microbiology, biology and nanotech, uh, we also do have our mentor, which is Anton, but we need someone who has knowledge of industrial designing or production engineering, and whoever is, whosoever is passionate about joining this team are more than welcome. Perfect. Awesome, thank, thank you. And I think one thing I'll do is uh, I'll connect the plastic teams with a few uh, industrial corporations that have uh, actually committed to removing plastic from their products by 2030. So these uh, industrial entities are really looking for large scale implementation of alternative materials. So there are some industrial connections there. Next is Isaac. Hi everybody, can you hear me? Perfect. Hi, all right, uh, waiting for the slides to come up. Uh, I'm Isaac, I'm in Chicago. Uh, this class is awesome, really nice to meet all of you. Manu, I've been a fan of yours for years, huge fan. I have like 20 fold scopes in my basement. It's awesome. Here's my bag. <laughs> okay, all yours, <laughs> Isaac. Okay, so the motivation for team friend designs is that biology is uh, magic. Uh, it's like an advanced alien nanotechnology that self replicates and is powered by the sun and can draw down carbon dioxide and fix it into food, medicine, and materials. And along with like renewable energy stuff, biological technology must be the material base of any sustainable human civilization that we can build in the next few years. However, the means of biological te uh, technological production, which are these enzymes, which are these little atomic machines that can manipulate and build and degrade and transform molecules with a sophistication and 
complexity unmatched by any other technology on earth. These enzymes are really expensive and hard to access, especially outside academia and industry in developed nations with well-developed biotechnological uh, uh, industries. Um, these enzymes cost hundreds of dollars from commercial suppliers. They're not available in many regions. And this has especially been made clear this year with the COVID-19 pandemic, where there have been shortages of these enzymes uh, all over the uh, world, even in developed nations. Um, however, this might be able to change because uh, there, have been, there's this pro uh, uh, there have been a few initiatives recently, like the Free Genes Project and the Open Enzyme Project that have made available basically Lego sets of genetic parts uh, that can be, you know, that contain all the parts you might need to purify and manufacture enzymes. So next slide. So our proposed solutions, how do we make enzymes and these biological technology uh, technologies available? Well, there are a few different ways we could do that. We could build genetic constructs for fruital enzyme production. So we'd actually design the genetic devices to do that, you know, and it's like, in contrast to the current technology, like vectors that cost hundreds of dollars from companies, we just make them and make them free and make them easy to use. Um, we could frugalize the process of actually purifying the enzyme you want from the cells and all the cellular debris, the chromatography process. You know, currently that's pretty expensive. The, the, the chromatography media is expensive. The machine's definitely very expensive. I bet we could make that really inexpensive. I would love to see how we could do that with like toilet paper. And finally, how do you characterize and quality control uh, the enzymes you make. So we want to characterize it. We'd love to make a frugal 96 volt microplate reader so we can manufacture in high throughput. All right, next slide. So our team, our team is awesome. So it's me in the US, it's Prince in Ghana, Alice in Brazil, Diego in Peru. We've got expertise in wetware design, electronics design, a whole bunch of stuff, but we need more people. We'd love more people and we need more expertise. We need like frugal hardware design prototyping, computational mathematical modeling, experimental characterization of fluid flow dynamics, and access to both bio labs and hardware prototyping labs. So we would love more people. Come join Team Friend Design. Let's democratize biotechnology. That was a master class name. in how to give a talk. That was fantastic, Isaac. We're out of time. I'm going to move to Sheetal. Uh, and then we'll follow offline, Isaac, on uh, we just developed a 96 well plate reader that's ready for testing. <laughs> That is so, so cool, awesome. Yeah, it's, it's coming your way. I'll actually try shipping one to some of you guys. Uh, Sheetal, you're next. And uh, Isaac, I'll connect offline. Uh, Hello, uh, is my voice audible? Yes, perfect. Great. Oh, uh, first of all, I would love to thank Isaac for that energetic <laughs> presentation and I hope to do justice with my presentation and I would love to have Isaac in our team. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so here we go. So we are the team uh, and family and we are tackling the question as uh, how ants can be used as bioindicators. So why ants? So um, uh, to give a short introduction, if you look at the insect community, 50% of the biomass actually comes from ants. So you can see how dominant they are in the insect community. And we have also recently seen that there is a decline in the insects as well. And when we look at ants, they are quite diverse and abundant. You can see in uh, urban landscapes, rural landscapes, in the parks, gardens, uh, they act as cedar harvesters and uh, very uh, rare pollinators though, but they are quite sensitive to climatic changes. And they are also uh, bioengineers helping in nutrient cycling as well as uh, facilitating plant growth. So considering all of these factors, uh, well, what's the main challenges that we see? So uh, the first challenge is uh, the scale. So if you look at ants, they're, they're quite small in size, microscopic, uh, ranging from one millimeter to about 20 millimeter. So they're not as big as we see uh, vertebrates, birds, or mammals. So how are we uh, going to come up with some frugal solutions to make some uh, magnification tools? We can't, because we can't use any um, magnifier to uh, look at these ants and identify them. And uh, another problem that we also see is the taxonomic key, which is usually very uh, 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 streamlined to entomology people and the jargons are not so easily understood by common person. So, and, and also all of these uh, uh, becomes difficult when we go at a, when we look at a large scale sampling. Next slide, please. So uh, 
to come up with the solutions, what we thought of was if we could come up with an application which could identify ants. Uh, so there is a problem with the optical solution as well, but this app could probably look through the morphology, the coloration of the ants, and it could probably filter out to at least at a genus level so that you can at least get an idea of if they are uh, uh, diverse and with this, you could also include information from the metadata, like the temperature, elevation, and the location that it is identified at. So something similar to eBird and iNaturalist that we have seen. And through these, we can tackle uh, very big questions like diversity mapping, population estimation, looking at comparison between uh, distribution in the urban landscape and the rural landscape, and see if, if there are dominant species that are moving endemic species to extinction. And I also see a very nice scope for common people to contribute as much to this because uh, uh, they always identify ants as black ants or red ants. So it's time to uh, dig deeper, I feel. Next slide, please. So our team consists of uh, very people from uh, physiology to botany to uh, zoology. And uh, you, you have already met uh, a budding paleontologist who's also quite enthusiastic. Uh, we would love to have uh, Benedict and Manish Kumar as well, who were actually very rightly introduced today. And uh, uh, we would also love to have uh, uh, programmers and uh, people who could uh, build AI algorithms for this. Thank you again. Thank you so much. Perfect. Uh, time's up, Sheetal. And I think, yeah, this is a prime time, uh, primarily because insect heads, uh, especially ant heads, are very specific. Uh, most common taxonomists use these visual techniques to actually identify them anyway. Uh, yeah, yeah. So With we'll catch up on Discord. Yeah. Next is sure. Harini. Thank you. Harini, can you unmute? Harini Sudha. Uh, okay, yes. Sorry, uh, I have I already presented. Oh, you've already presented. So how come your name was on the... Let me look again. Uh, uh, what happened to you? Did the uh, MicroPipette group already go? No. Um, oh, interesting. I, I may have missed copy. Shivari. So I will try searching for, uh, yeah, anybody from the micro pipette group, if they want to comment, uh, who should we unmute? Um, I see Nadim, so let me try Nadim. No, Nadim, no, Nadim. Um, okay, so we might have to move to the next one and we'll come back. I think next is Iqbal on COVID tests. So let me, okay. Uh, Iqbal, Hi. you're next. Yes, can you hear me? Perfect. Yes, all right, let's go. Um, yeah, so the topic is, uh, can we develop a frugal platform for testing COVID-19 at home? So we are right in the middle of a pandemic, and I guess, I mean, it's kind of pointless to explain why we need more tests, but I, I'd, I'd like to argue in the direction of why, why we need more frugal tests and why we need to do universal testing rather than medical testing. So if you pay attention to the top right uh, chart over there, which is basically a chart of around 300 pregnant women tested in the U.S., so if you if you see that the orange side, which is which indicates that most of these positive cases were asymptomatic, okay, most of the positive cases. And if you focus on the bottom chart, the red one, you would see that 12% of the asym of the positive cases presented themselves with symptoms that were not listed in CDC guidelines. So basically, no CDC symptoms. So this basically indicates that there is an overlap with other diseases, and there is a need for widespread availability of diagnostic kits, like a fold scope that you can carry um, and do the test under a tree if you like. Uh, so universal testing is more important than medical testing. Can we go to the next slide, please? So I'd like to quickly dive, can we go to the next slide, please? Yeah, sorry. 
Yeah, so I'd like to quickly dive into the kinds of tests that are out there and how we can innovate uh, using similar concepts or we can dramatically change uh, the way we test it. But let's look at what is already out there. So there are like three kinds of tests. One is a molecular test, then the antibody test and the antigen test. So on the right hand side, I have given the schematic here and also note posted the kind of ideas that we can do use to change those tests. The molecular test is fairly straightforward, where you take the sample, extract the RNA, amplify the RNA, uh, sorry, convert it into the complementary DNA, and then amplify the DNA so that it is detectable. So the problems uh, or the, 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 the design ideas that we can use if we go in that direction would be to de decrease the cost, increase the scale, and also make it point of care, which, is it, which it is not right now. The antibody test is interestingly not really a diagnostic test. It is more of a, uh, you know, a surveillance test where if you have antibodies uh, generated in your body due to an infection, so you can detect it. It's more like a pregnancy test and it works in a very similar fashion. Interestingly, it's not very specific. However, the antigen test is the reverse of the antibody test where you basically add the antigen and see if it reacts to the specific antibodies. So that test is fairly specific. Uh, it has a lot of false negatives though. So if you are a positive, you know you are positive. If you're negative, you, it's not very sure. So, but it is truly point of care in the way it is designed. So that, that's one direction. And I just got to know that there's a new paper out, uh, I mean, from Jennifer Dodna's group, where they're using CRISPR technology to do COVID tests, which is like less than $5 using a mobile phone. Can we go to the next slide, please? So here are the key takeaways that we don't have uh, uh, at home kit. And as you can see on the right hand side that we are sort of approaching a third wave and the design considerations would be to make it point of care, uh, work on the cost, sensitivity versus specificity and the limit of detection. Uh, here's the team, uh, it comprises of my, myself, Soharth, Amit and Vivit. And we would welcome new ideas and members who uh, can contribute in the following areas of expertise. And thank you for your attention. Perfect, time's up. And then Iqbal, sure. I'll connect you to, there are two home tests that we are building in the lab. So there's a lot uh, to kind of connect you with yeah. on the teams that are on the way right now. Uh, next is awesome. Adit. Thank you. Adito Nag. And... Hi, Perfect. can you hear me? Yes. All right. Um, while Tyler is opening the slide, um, hi, I'm Adito Nag and I'm presenting on behalf of Team Dropcast. So yeah, before I draw you to the problem, I uh, ask you to look at the image. I'm not sure if you can see it properly, but perhaps at, at one point of your life, you probably encountered this test. This is the ubiquitous blood test. So one fascinating thing about blood test is that blood is one of the most versatile biomarkers and one of the most, great, uh, one of the most excellent biomarkers out there. In fact, blood tests are one of the most common tests in the world. There are 1.2 blood tests a year as of 2017. However, just because there are so many blood tests and the demand is so high, it often poses a lot of challenges. For one thing, most of these blood tests cost upward of $10. I don't measure um, an upper ceiling of the price for a reason, I'll let you guess why. But like, given the vast, uh, vast type, different types of blood tests, there is a whole spectrum of costs that range from somewhere from $10 to even $80 or more. So, what this does is often make it inaccessible for many people out there. Another thing, blood tests are being the most popular test out there has an incredibly high demand, which means its demand oftentimes outstrips supply. For example, one of the blood disorders that's very common is anemia and 25% of the entire globe suffers from it. That's as of 2017, 1.6 billion people. Creating enough tests for 1.6 billion people, especially in areas that suffer the most from these kind of disorders, which oftentimes are low-income countries, is extremely harsh for resource-strained hospitals. In fact, a blood test normally takes anywhere from 24 to 72 hours and usually occurs in large referral centers, not, small, not in the small community centers that are more accessible to rural people who live in rural areas. If, I, if we could take the aggregate amount of time people waited to get a blood test, it would be equal to 14,000 years. That is an immense amount of time. 
and especially this is particularly harmful for some patients who are like who are who need frequent blood tests for example these are patients who suffer from malaria or dengue and these people need frequent blood tests what this means is that hospitals are oftentimes swarmed and overworked and some patients can't even access the important lab facilities that require this test in the first place so we need something simpler more efficient and cheaper to meet this unmet demand um, the next slide please so this is our solution develop a point of care test using blood droplet drying patterns so before i move on i'd like to like take a glimpse of the picture on the right these are two blood droplet drying two dried blood droplets as an image one thing to note these look very big but in real life this is just a six millimeter diameter droplet on a microscope slide as you can see in the first image that image is from a person with a healthy um healthy phys physiological and metabolic conditions and his blood droplet uh, characteristic is very very different from the person um, on the bottom, on the lower portion, uh, the blood droplet depicted in the lower portion. There are no white cracks. There's a completely different pattern. And that person, that, the person at the bottom part of the image is actually someone who suffers from anemia. We believe these differences that are very, very visible to someone, even as simple as a microscope slide, makes it immensely valuable for a diagnosis because we're condensing something like a 24 or 72 hour test in 30 minutes, that's the amount of time that takes to dry the blood, for, for the blood to dry. So what we plan to use is use something like a deep learning. Time's yeah, up. I'll just, you should just yeah, introduce I'll just the team. Yeah. Yes. We're just using a deep learning algorithm to test this blood. And this is our team. There's a, law, there's a vast majority of people who are from different backgrounds, from material science to data science to bioengineering, me. And we have our mentor, he's Deepal Krishnamurti. He's helping us in the biophysics and the blood droplet drying mechanics. But we're looking forward to anyone who can help us collect data sets, any particular person in the medical field who can help us study this, because that's usually the problem in medical fields. So yeah, hope to see some amazing contributions from these team as well. Awesome. Uh, let's move to Sakshi. And I know it's already two, but since we only have three or four more teams, we will stretch. Uh, and finally go through everybody. So Sakshi Thakur. So I am trying to unmute you. Sakshi, can you comment if you can unmute? Uh, I'm clicking and uh, don't see, I see the only name listed here is Sakshi. So I know you are there. Unmute. Tyler, can you try doing the same thing? Yeah, I can. I think usually it's more on the participant side because um, they need to accept the unmute request. Oh, um, so I maybe see. we can jump to the next one first. Oh, this is not your team. Okay. This is Sakshi. Amrutkar, sorry, that's my fault. Let me just try Amrutkar, Amrutkar. Okay, Amrutkar is not here. Ah, okay, um, looks like uh, this one actually, I think they may have pre-recorded a video. Uh, yeah, I think they may have said they couldn't make it, so they pre-recorded this Sachi video. You mean or? Yes, uh, that's right. Okay, do you have the video? I do, so I'll play it okay. now. Let's play it. That's creative and unusual. <laughs> I think we... Oh, is it playing, Tyler? It is, can you not hear? No, we don't hear any audio. Ah, that is... Frustrating. Okay, I don't know how to do that, so I'm going to send that to everyone afterwards. Let's go on to the next yeah. one. Yeah, let's move to Tanuj. And I'm unmuting Tanuj now. So Tanuj. Hello, can you hear me now? Perfect. All yours. All right, thank you. So um, my name is Tanuj. Um, I'm presenting on behalf of the team of the Frugal Scanning Electron Microscope. So uh, in a nutshell, uh, if we just had to put it in one line, we would say, can we make a scanning electron microscope accessible to kids in classrooms? And the reason we want to do that is SEMs will provide way better magnification and resolution um, than conventional microscopes. And as you can see in the background of the slide, there's a 
there's an SEM picture of the head of a, of a fly. So as you can see, it's quite lifelike. And the problem here is that most SEMs are pretty expensive. They're upwards of $100,000 and they go easily into millions of uh, dollars. So of course, not everyone can use an SEM. So in addition to uh, kids in classrooms being able to use it, if people outside of bigger laboratories could use it, like that includes people like me, that would be great. And uh, I think I must mention that this is uh, a project that has been going on for a while at Stanford. So um, I really uh, look forward to uh, making this better. So could you go to the next slide, please? All right, so this is a, a basic schematic of the uh, SEM. And um, let me start at the top. So we wanna, we wanna uh, accelerate electrons to say 40 kilo electron volts. So that means that would be a power source of 40 kilovolts. And then when the electrons go, go down and right at the bottom is where your sample is placed and then electrons scatter off of the, the sample and detectors, you have electron uh, detectors that uh, take the image and then that image can be constructed uh, using a computer. And I must mention here that all of this happens in a vacuum. I mean, if you're talking about a normal SEM. So all of those, uh, when you want to turn into a frugal electron microscope, all of those require work. So for example, if we started the top left, back to the top left, if we wanted uh, a source of 40 kilovolts, we could maybe talk about printable batteries and people are doing a lot of great work using say electrolytes, making arrays of batteries. Um, someone even suggested that maybe we could modify a sort of a Van de Graaff generator and see what happens. So, and, and, and when the electrons scatter off of the sample, they need to be detected and usually detectors of semiconductors like silicon or gallium arsenide and stuff like that, but those are pretty expensive. So that's, that's another place that needs work to make a frugal and thin electron detector. And finally, because this is a scanning electron microscope, um, uh, we need to be moving the sample. We need to be scanning a, a raster image of it. So that requires some mechanical work, but since we had a lecture on compliant mechanisms, uh, we are maybe thinking that that's a potential place for us to um, be, be putting it in the, uh, the mechanical, mechanically scanned sample stage. Um, finally, there's a lot of problems in SEM that we think modern computation can solve that have not been used yet. So for example, using machine learning and image correction techniques uh, for, um, while making it frugal at the same time. And uh, since scanning electron microscopy happens at a lower pressure than if you, if you just do it in air, you just get a bad image. Another thing that we wanna help is to achieve uh, lower pressures like say 10 torrs easily. And for reference, the, the room pressure is at 760 torrs. Uh, next slide, please. Last slide. All right, so yeah, this is, this is the team that we have. Uh, there's a lot of people in electronics, including me, that's Tanoj and Lakshman, Sumed, Toshali, Vishwajit, Ankit, Sebastian, and Samir. We have someone in physics, we have Andrea, and of course we're very lucky to have uh, Professor Fabian Pease as our uh, mentor. He provided the image in the second slide, so thank you for that. But the expertise that we need uh, are battery designers, mechanical engineers, people with experience in microscopy, but most importantly, people who don't have any experience in any of these, because then uh, you know, we can think out of the box for uh, solutions. So yeah, that's, that's about it. Yeah, and I think just a comment on this is, uh... Fabian and I have been working on this project for almost four years now. And uh, mm -hmm. it's fantastic to see the team on, there are so many subsystems in this project that even if we end up tackling one subsystem, that would be phenomenal. And historic note on this, Fabian was the first person to put a living organism inside an electron microscope and demonstrate that living organisms can actually survive that vacuum. So there's a beautiful science paper that you should all look at. It's a, uh, okay, let's transition to the next team. I think it's Puneet. Uh, Puneet, can you unmute yourself? Um, I am trying. Okay. Hey, hey, everyone. We can hear you. Audible? All yours. Yeah, yeah. Hey, this is uh, Puneet. I'm representing Frugal Optics team, not to be confused with the presentation we had today. <laughs> so let me, yeah, uh, hopefully we'll be a part of it. But uh, yes. right now, let, let me take your attention to the image we have over here. It's an image of a beautiful scenic uh, mountain range, but the picture is not perfect. 
uh, it's got blurs it is uh, doesn't have colors it has got black patches about a billion people all around the world suffer from one or of, uh, one or many of these uh, conditions and their situation is not addressed till now and uh, who estimates that uh, at least uh, 14 billion dollars uh, to address uh, this gap so the challenge if we want to take up solving this uh, issue frugally are many and it is uh, common to the application of any modern technology in a resource constrained setup next slide but the solution we have some ideas around the solution i have always imagined creating microscopes using uh, water droplets uh um, there are existing solution that actually use uh, water uh you know they uh, change the surface of water so that to get the optical properties uh, they they want the scope and opportunities that open up if we solve uh, this frugally are uh, are huge from uh, prescription lenses uh, to education and hobbyists it can open doors to education and uh, hobbyists and uh, in an advanced level to advanced uh, medical devices uh this this idea provides a unique set of opportunities the fluids or the water itself can vary the focal length uh, if we uh, very cleverly it is uh, recyclable you can refill it so the advantages are huge next slide so the team we have is uh, pretty physics heavy right now uh, i come from a mechanical background puneet we have uh, someone in optics we have someone in electronics and uh, physics as well as optics and we have a ge genetic engineer as well we are looking for any new person with a different kind of perspective who are who's excited to join our team uh, mentors who are in optics as well as uh, in social domain makers um uh, and having access to fab labs or maker spaces or optics lab so yeah that's all from us uh, perfect right on time um and then i think uh, there is a lot of work that's been done on frugal glasses and eyewear uh, using pressure filled cavities as well it's worth learning from that we'll move to the operation moonwatch ephrem habte So I'm going to try to unmute you. Uh, um, yes, can you hear me? Perfect. Okay. Uh, thank you, Manu. Uh, I'm Efrem, and uh, our project is called Operation Moonwatch, uh, which is a citizen project modeled after the Name Tech program that occurred in the late 1950s, whose goal was to enlist the aid of amateur astronomers and other citizens who would help professional scientists spot the first uh, artificial satellite and Our team's primary goal is to develop the world citizens I mean to provide the world citizens with affordable and good quality telescopes uh, which addresses the problem of limited access to set up to set equipment for the majority of the population across the globe so that young people like myself can study the moon surface in detail to get a good look at our astronomy astronomical neighbor and we have identified five specific goals so far for our telescope design and The main one is the price which should be $10 or less since we're trying to make it accessible uh, for the general population and also the telescope should have a uh, high enough optical quality to resolve clean images of the geological surface uh, details of the moon and plus like the telescope should also be comfortable and easy to use by astronomy novices for lengthy observation sessions and uh, to ensure the possibility of a uh, widely distributed fabrication of our, of our open source uh, telescope the manufacturing of components assembly and maintenance of the device should be as simple as possible and the telescope should also have a robust construction and be able to handle like normal wear and tear and should be easily repairable if damaged and the stress goals for our telescope we've come up with so far include the ability to resolve good images of large uh, planets such as jupiter and saturn and also to make it more small portable and modular for easy usage and finally to develop the micro computer uh, control tracking mount for the use of telescope and uh, next slide please and the solution state we've come up with uh, for the telescope so far include a reflector type telescope for good image quality and simplicity of parts and construction a transparent structure to reduce the weight and also
also replacing the traditional rigid tube with lighter and easier DIY accordion tube or paper origami or closed gallows, and also using existing devices for the reflector cells called key optical components and um, using magnified shaving mirror as the primary mirror and a variant of the fold scope with the longer focal lengths as the observational eyepiece and also to use compliant mechanisms to be explored and also we want compliant mechanisms to be explored to be explored instead of the traditional mechanical connections to reduce the weight and assembly complexity. And next slide please. Uh, we have nine crewmates among us with no imposters, thank God, and uh, we're from six different countries spanning across the globe and we have a great uh, team with skill set diversity which include a shared, shared passion for astronomy and astronomy education. Expertise we need are telescope optics, astronomy, instrument engineering, and tool designs. Uh, educational tool designs will be appreciated. Uh, will be appreciated. And lastly, I would like to mention the ancient civilization and how our ancestors were all astronomers, and they had greater connection with the universe beyond our world than we currently have now. And best example for this is the number of astronomers in the U.S. You would expect it to be a large number since U.S. has the most access to telescope, but surprisingly, according to the Astronomical Society of the Pacific, the number ranging from people just curious about astronomy to professional astronomers is only about 250,000 people out of 382, I mean 328 million people. This shows us how much more we need to make telescopes accessible. And our team believes that looking up has always led humanity to greatness before and it will lead us to even more now because when it comes to the astronomy, even the stars are not the limit. Thank you very much. <laughs> what a fantastic way to close the day today. A uh, lot to follow up on that thread. Uh, uh, but I think, oh, we've already covered Tanvi, right? On the oral side. Yeah, and yep, since I think we're, we're already set. 15, 20 minutes off, uh, if there was anybody that has not been able to present, uh, just ping us so that in the next start of the next lecture on Tuesday, uh, we'll pick that up. Uh, and again, you know, I think this is just a reminder of how much work we have cut out for all of us. Uh, phenomenal groups of talks. And I think one of the threads that we will try to now do is after this next uh, Frugal Optics lectures, we will transition a little bit of how we run the classes where the class time will actually be used as design sessions where we'll be actively working for an hour and a half together with specific mentors that are online for those teams and then jump into rooms. So there will be a little bit of a transition onto action for the classes itself. Uh, and I think that, Fred, uh, yeah, go ahead, Tyler. Yeah, and also following this, uh, I'll be sending out another form. Um, we're gonna be putting all of these projects up on the official site uh, for the course. I know a lot of people are interested to hear more about these projects. Um, so I'll be sending out a form for you guys to submit like a basic image of your team, a team name, and we'll put those up so they're officially on the site. Um, and also and a little think, more info. Yeah, go for it, Manu. Yeah, one of the threads that I wanted to mention is uh, this is just related to also uh, every project should have a Notion page. Uh, and there is a template that you should, the Notion page is going to be a lab notebook, but this is how you're documenting your progress because many of the projects have long-term ambitions and goals. And the goal is to initiate them in such a manner that everything that you do is documented very well. So however far you reach in the next five or six weeks, but this is going to be intense weeks, but it's very important that now as a team, up till now you've had Notion pages for your own class assignments. Now we should transition to and use that Notion page both as a public facing website, but also just the documentation of what we're doing. And we're going to use this grid that I just described as a way to also recruit a few more mentors because what I would ideally like is to at least have one person dedicated to every team. Uh, and there is a little bit of a logistics to think about uh, on how we will run the sets of classes post the case studies that we will finish with the last case study. Uh, okay, so we'll say bye everybody. I think we're already 20 minutes over. Uh, thank you everyone for joining, a uh, lot to connect upon, uh, and then excited about the next coming weeks. Good night and good morning. Bye everyone. Thanks everyone.